it was to the Dramatists Guild, and uh, they got on it right away. And uh, I, yeah. I, I will say, from you know, the, the 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 number one rule is ask, but there are going to be times when the author says no. Um, for instance, Edward Albee will not allow any changes in the way that he has written the play. You will see an African-American production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof or Streetcar Named Desire. You will not, at least up till now and for the foreseeable future, see an African-American production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Do I necessarily agree with that? No, I don't. I think, you know, if Jesse Norman can play Brunhilde, then, you know, <laughs> Halle Berry can play Martha, you know, but Edward Albee doesn't agree with that. And he has some, you know, he has logical, from his point of view, reasoning for that. But as Ralph has pointed out, he owns the play. He owns his work. You can ask, they say no, go do, you know, the birthday party or whatever. It's you know. interesting. Well, so, before yeah. we go on, I, I want to bring, bring the room into this because I think there's an interesting conversation, you know, there's several things that frankly you all can do. Um, many of the people here are working at significant professional theaters. Um, they're probably less likely to encounter this and I don't want to get into the issue of if this is happening in your theater, you know, who do you call? Should you say something? I think that's an ethical conversation for LNDA to discuss. But I will say that many of you also teach, and many of you are aware of work both in colleges, community theaters, etc., in your com in your community. And I have heard anecdotally at this point um, that in many uh, university programs, directors are encouraged to play with text. And we should say that not every country holds the same position about fidelity to the author's words and intent that America does. We could have a long conversation about Germany and Reggie Theater and what that's all about. But, so there's one thing to teaching the idea about how you might explore texts differently, but if the idea that is being taught is that you have the right to alter texts, if high school students see their teachers, their administration altering texts with no repercussions, that is where this comes from, and, and then to a larger issue that I, that I that that, that's important and I think we all want to go on to is we've reached a society in with flexibility in teaching about different approaches in different countries and I will say I got beat up uh, uh, in, in print uh, for writing a piece about the alteration of texts which was totally the American view that the playwright comes first that I heard from people in Canada and people in England who really just said everything I'd said was dumb and stupid. And, you know, I've, I'm more careful in my remarks now in terms of speaking about America and about copyright law. But fundamentally, having been raised in the not-for-profit American regional theater, uh, I do believe that the playwright is at the center of the work, that all of us, whether we are artists or in my case an administrator, are there to serve that work. But it's, it's only by learning more about what is going on, it's more about communication. And I don't want to dominate this, but I'll just say very quickly, I had a call um, a few months back from a school newspaper in a town uh, north of Los Angeles that was concerned uh, uh, the student had gotten wind of the fact that they were doing a production of Chorus Line and as the, the, the reporter told me they were cutting songs and altering lyrics. And I immediately said, oh, they've got to be going after Dance 10 Looks 3. Um, and I reached out to the teachers. And the next thing I knew, I had a call from those teachers and the principal. 
and I have to say proceeded to have an hour-long discussion in which they made clear they were not cutting any songs, they were not cutting the words tits and ass, though they were hoping, based on other productions they had seen which had done it, to reduce the number of times the words tits and ass were used in the song and had a very cogent reason for saying, look, it's going to get an uproarious response. If it's five times in the song, the song isn't going to be heard. No choice but to tell the licensing house about this. Uh, you've made a cogent argument to me, but it's not my place to agree or disagree. And I said, I'll make you a deal. I really think you should call the licensing house and talk to them about it. I said, I will give you 24 hours. And then when I call, I hope the answer is going to be, you've already talked to them. And indeed, it was a little longer than 24 hours, I made the call. And in fact, they had called. The licensing house was waiting on a list of things that they'd hoped to change. Uh, they had gotten the list yet. A couple of hours later, I got an email from the licensing house saying, it's all addressed. So again, it goes back to the idea of you won't always get approval. I mean, frankly, making a call about an Edward Albee play is a fool's errand. But if there are things f for creative reasons, for legal reasons, for educational reasons, I use a phrase my parents always told me. It never hurts to ask. All people can do is say no. But uh, if you don't ask, you don't get. The, um, um, I mean, drawing to play, I would, yes, uh, go, yes, yes, why not, please, yes. All right. We're now running the microphone back to the back of the room. Hi, um, I'm Diane Brewer. I teach at the University of Evansville. And when you started talking about this question coming up at universities, in fact, it does come up at universities. Um, and I've had a like revelation, I guess, this year that on one hand, I think the way that we need to approach it at universities, and it works when we approach it at universities, when we say, it's kind of simple, it's the author's work, right? Period. That it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. But there is a flip side to it, which I think we sometimes forget when we talk about this issue from the punitive perspective. Do you know, if you do this, then this is going to happen, you know, and, and, there, and you're going to be prosecuted. Like, that's when people start thinking, well, you know, maybe this case is a little bit different and all of that. So, so I've tried to approach it from the flip side that it can actually be exciting to have this conversation, to bring the playwright who is alive but not in the room into the process. And, and I've found that when I approach it in that way, that the whole attitude changes completely, completely. Like people are actually excited about asking for permission because, it's, because the attitude is different. Does well, exactly, because, you know, if, you're, if you just go ahead and do what you want to do um, and, and don't bring the playwright into the conversation, that's theft. And so when we hear about it, and we rely on whistleblowers a great deal in, in my job, um, it's already happened when we hear about it that sometimes the production is closing the next day. So we have to send that punitive letter. We have to say, we're going to, you know, you, you are in breach of United States copyright law, and boom, 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 boom. And it scares the bejesus out of people sometimes, and a lot of times people don't even know that they've done something wrong. So this is where the Guild has come in, and Howard as well, in, in a big way, in recent years, education is a very important thing because, as you say, in this world of, you know, oh, well, you know, I have my son, 17 years old. He, you know, I downloaded um, I, this movie, Wonderland, because he wanted to see it, no, uh, Tomorrowland. And I looked at it on, on his computer and I was like, where'd you get that? I don't think that's out. And plus, it had subtitles in Spanish, which <laughs> made me realize he'd found it in some strange place and he kind of gave me a look. And he knows 
that, you know, both of his dads work in the theater and that we're com concerned with, you know, copyright and all of that. But he needs to be educated and he's the son of the publisher, you know? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. That the approaching this from a legalistic, you know, I'm going to throw you in jail or if you do this kind of thing, is, is, is not going to work. At least not in, in isolation. Um, we've been talking internally with the anti-piracy committee and the guild about getting offering to schools uh, either in person or Skype um, conversations with living writers to schools that are considering doing their works to have sort of a workshop with them if they are agreeing not to steal sheet music, you know, and uh, uh, monologues and things like that. Um, we're trying to look at more affirmative ways to, because the, I know if I want my daughter or son to do something, tell them not to, right? So we're in the telling them not to business right. in a society which thinks information wants to be free, you know? No, you want the information to be free. That's a different issue. Uh, information is just information. So let's, we have to acknowledge that there's a penalty for this stuff, but we also need to find ways to make the ethics of, of, of tr how you treat authors um, to be a more positive experience. And I think we've been going around colleges, talking to schools, talking to groups, trying to incorporate into um, class, you know, the syllabus, the business of playwriting. How would you as an author want to be treated? How should you expect to be treated in this industry? And there's not a lot of that going on in schools. And playwrights are coming out of these programs without, with a real ignorance about who they are in this process. We see that as a real hole that needs to be filled. The Guild is trying to develop a syllabus for that or, you know, something that could be incorporated into existing uh, teaching programs. We've also been going around, uh, you may be aware, the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. I used to go to all the regional conferences of that, and I would walk through the design display rooms. I always love to walk through and look at the scenic designs and the costume designs of the kids who are putting their stuff up for competition. And there's a description of the work uh, next to the display, and they always say the title of the play, and when the the director or <laughs> of the play sometimes and the designer talks about how they were trying to serve the director's vision and sometimes there's no type that you don't know who wrote the play I saw things on assassins you didn't know it was written by Stephen Sondheim and John Weidman but you knew who the student director was <laughs> so I think that's an in that's a window into the mentality of the way this material is being taught if, if there's no emphasis or, or no respect for the work of the text, how can you expect the kids to have any? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I also want to say, I mean, it's exciting and, and to, to feel empowered and to, to reach out to the living playwrights and stuff, but it's also exciting. I mean, the challenge, too, is taking the text you're given and making it work and not, you know, because uh, there is, it, it is kind of a new thing like, okay, but here's what I think, so let me add this, you know, um, of, of getting it in it as written, you know, and making, working within a limitation, which is the exciting thing about a, a play. It's like, here are the words, here's the situation, how do I breathe life into it, how do I make it work? So I think that has to be part of it, too, of just, uh, I, And I, I just want to quickly, because it's Amanda speaking here, I, I would be curious how, because Amanda is the daughter of Adolf Green, I'm assuming you have a lot to say about your dad's works. Yeah, no, it's... And that's another thing. Sometimes we're dealing with the living playwright, and sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're dealing with the heir to that playwright who is no longer with us. And, you know, in Amanda's case, thank God, the heir is someone who is of the theater, who knows about the theater, and can make an informed, intelligent decision about that. Sometimes you're going to be dealing with somebody who knows from nothing. So I just say that as a... Yeah, no, I mean, I, so my mom is the, Phyllis Newman, who's the head, is, you know, the, my dad's state, but I definitely deal with it. And yeah, we deal with it all the time, too, because I, I love their work. And, and um, again, you know, directors have said, like, uh, or a producer, like, that's hey, dated. And, and if they, you know, there may be some references that are dated. Um, 
but also uh, writers have been brought in and I know my mom had a hard time of like no 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 you know like but at least they were bringing it to her but some things ended up well gosh I don't know you yes I did in on the 20th century I did make change I did why why because I felt like it, and I just thought, no, uh, the, <laughs> no, the director came to me in the, in the case of On the 20th Century, there's a song that my dad and Betty at, at Comden and Cy Coleman had written called The Legacy, and the director came to me for two reasons uh, and asked me to look at the lyric or just reconceive the moment. One was the punchlines were um, all references to things like uh, a cape from Floridora, uh, my ticket stubs to A.B.'s Irish Rose, things that he thought were jokes that would not register with the audience. He also felt dramatically that the song, uh, it was a list of things that the producer was going to leave to his henchman because he was giving up. And he starts the scene with take, taking out a pistol and says, I'm going to kill myself, there's nothing to live for, and here's what I'm going to leave you. And the song was a list song, and he felt it stopped the dramatic tension of the moment. Uh, he, he, my mother is the head of the estate, so he went to my mom and she said, yeah, I, I agree with you, it does stop the dramatic tension of the moment, and people don't really know if Floridora is not going to get laughs and things like that. Uh, so I agreed to reconceive it and look at it, and I talked to the director, and we all said, if we don't think it works, then we're not going to do it. You know, and I, <clears throat> so I was very careful about it, and I, I, I decided using the same music, and I wrote a new intro, for lyrics and I was like no their their lyrics are better you know so but we came up with something that we all felt worked but it was definitely a, a, a process with everybody going through it. Uh, Gabo Green at La uh, posted on the LMDA list of a couple of days ago that asking uh, if anyone had experience with the Noel Coward estate around matters of altering of setting or time and uh, Amy Rose Marshall with uh, Sam French got back to him saying they rep the estate for amateur productions, but that she did have some information on limitations. That's how she, she phrased the response. I was wondering if you could, um, uh, Ralph or Peter, maybe uh, talk about the kinds of conversations that are had with estates around this, um, to determine these, uh, social, uh, these, these limitations. Do they... Well, um, yeah. As I said earlier, I, I think that there are some, some estates are very flexible. Um, some estates are, you know, you're dealing with one person. You know, with with Adolph Green, you're dealing with Phyllis Newman and Amanda Green. Um, with the estate of Tennessee Williams, that's you know that is represented by the University of the South, and they rely, I believe, a great deal on their agent, which is a an agent based in London, um, and they seem very flexible. Some estates are not going to be flexible. Some estates are going... Sorry. The Beckett estate, that's a perfect example. Beckett will not allow any... Because that was Samuel Beckett's position during his lifetime. No changes, nothing. you you got to have that tree exactly where he says it's going to be, you know... No, I don't believe so. I mean, if there is, they may get done, but I don't. They may not be approved. That said, there was a Broadway production of Godot not very many years ago, in which um, it was set largely among almost craggy, rocky terrain, and people entered through these large boulders, right. and that is not a bare stage, and Broadway, it's pretty hard to miss. I'm speaking of the production with Nathan Lane and Bill like Irwin at Roundabout. Okay. Um, no, 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 not the, not the older one. Um, you know, there's something very interesting that happens, and I, I know there's a question for you guys, and so I'll add to it, which is, sometimes people do reimagine something in a very small place where it's not they've not gotten permission, it is discovered, and sometimes, whether it's the author or the estate, decide they like it. So in a way, that complicates this conversation. That's what happened with Sondheim. It's a conversation. Um, it's yeah, a conversation. it is a conversation. That's the main thing. Right. I mean, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Uh, 
a lot of times it's administrations and Facebook is your friend because every time something gets posted that it happens to one institution you carry it in and, and others get the message but I also want to tell you and I would be curious to hear what Diane and Jules and the other university faculty in here have to say I have reviewed a lot of textbooks in all these years I cannot remember one textbook that has the section on the playwright that talks about the rights of the playwright and how you don't put a mustache on a painting and and I I urge well, you to go to the textbook publishers well here's the thing I mean I'm a publisher and what there is and there should be in every textbook and if there's not then that's the problem of the agent or whatever there's a copyright notice and there and if there's a copyright notice it tells you where you need to go to get the rights to that play Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry. That's exactly what I was talking about in terms of curricula in, in, in universities. This focus on, on the playwright and is, is absent. But it's absent, you'd expect it to be absent in certain areas, but in the MFA writing programs themselves, they are not, and I'm generalizing, they are not empowering the playwrights to make to have these expectations. And very often they're infantilizing playwrights by saying, you know, this is a group project, it's collaborative, everybody's gonna work together to fix your play. You know, it's, it's there's, there's no um, support for the notion that a play is the expression of a unique voice and that the production's purpose is to, uh, um, recognize that voice and, and, and make it live. Um, there's more of a focus on uh, group process, on um, pedagogy, there's, there's, you know, which you would understand in, in, an, in an academic environment, but it doesn't necessarily serve the interest of the playwright and therefore not necessarily serving the interest of the American theater. Well, can I jump in and say on the issue with textbooks, unless it's something the Guild wants to get involved in, this is the sort of project that now that I've established um, the Arts Integrity Program at the New School, I can do research on. So my, my fast comment slash commercial is to say if people want to contact me right now, the website for um, the Integrity Initiative isn't built, but just through contact me through hesherman.com, tell me the textbooks because I'm not a teacher I'm you know I'm new to this send me the names all of you send me the names of common textbooks that don't or ones that do and then collaboratively with with the guild with others we can we can start to reach out and talk to them we are in the process of developing a, a text uh, uh, for the playwright uh, for teaching playwriting uh, how to incorporate this other uh, beyond craft, you know, what is it the playwright needs to know uh, about their business. And we are also, all schools are, um, can become subscribers to the Guild, and you get all of our publications and access to all of our downloadable uh, articles, many of which deal with these kind of issues. Um, we give free uh, memberships sometimes to students uh, on a one-year basis to get them involved. So there's all different ways, if you are in an academic institution, to become part of the guild in a way where you can make this information available to your students on a regular basis at a, almost no cost. So I encourage you, if, if this is something you're interested in, it's out there. Just contact our office and we can help you. I just want to jump in for a second just to change the conversation a little. To, uh, Howard is reminding me about um, songs and changing songs. They, the songs are a text as well. This, I get, I, um, in this misbegotten production of Hands on a Hard Body, um, the director had one, the end of one song, instead of ending in a button, he had it bleed into the next scene, so people started talking while the music was, was not a good directorial decision. But <clears throat> it also alters the song and the way it does it. And he uh, cut 
I, the opening number was happening, and all of a sudden I was like, wait, it's over. What happened to that, that part? He took it out, what I consider a very important part of the song, this woman singing about to God, about how she needs a truck, you know. Um, you know, so those things are, uh, those are real, you know, uh, things that uh, bother <laughs> songwriters and can change the meaning of the musical um, and, and changing the sex of who, in the same production, you know, a woman sang a song who was not, instead of the, this other character, uh, the sex isn't as important as who the character was. Um, and, um, uh, you know, all, uh, even changing keys, you, well, no, that's, but that's something you do have to ask. Um, and uh, tempos, all those things radically change a song. I said, you know, what a number was changed into this slow, slow dirge, and then like a song that's very moving was like dum 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 dum. dum you know, so all of those, all of those things are are important and integral as well. Interestingly enough, I'm talking about songs. Another area that seems to be coming up more and more recently. Uh, which, and perhaps it's just a, a function of the age in which we live, in which, you know, music is with many people, you know, 24-7. Um, playwrights these days, my experience as a publisher now, and perhaps some of the agents' experiences as well with playwrights, tend to write, it seems, with a, with a soundtrack in their head. So, not only do I, as the publisher, have to think about the play itself, very often there will be six or seven copyrighted songs which are included in the work of the playwright. Now, when you're doing your productions in, you know, the theater that has, you know, a four-week run or in a college, you know, a two-weekend run, nobody's going to find out that you put in, you know, four Beatles songs or you know, a Jerry, a, a Jerry Herman's Hello Dolly or whatever. But when it comes across my desk and it wants to be published, the rights to those songs have to be cleared. And a lot of playwrights doesn't even occur to them that not only are their rights important, but the rights of the composer lyricists are important as well. I, this is something we talk to our members about all the time. I mean, we have a business affairs department. Members call us and ask us questions. Can I do this? Can I do that? Um, and the use of other people's material in their plays is something we are constantly talking to them about. And it's basically the golden rule. Don't do something to somebody else you wouldn't want done to you. Um, so if you think you need the rights, you probably do. Um, you, can get, you can get away with things, but do you want somebody getting away with your plays, uh, with the abuses of your play? Uh, so we have seminars on this. We have a conference coming up in a few weeks in La Jolla, and we are having a whole thing on, can I do that? <laughs> um, the answers are generally no, but, but there is something in, in copyright law called fair use. And this is a case we just got involved with. Uh, there's a play by um, a playwright named David Ashme, who wrote a play called 3C, which was a parody of Three's Company, um, taking it uh, in a whole new direction, and the, and the uh, to, say the to say the least, <laughs> and the the owners, the pup, the producers of the original sitcom were not happy, and uh, basically uh, stopped the production prematurely, and um, wrote him cease and desist letters, and he, he was going to just put the play away and move on, but publishers approached him and it's like, well, we would actually be interested in publishing this if you can clear up this issue. So there was a lawsuit, uh, the Guild, the Drums Legal Defense Fund all, it joined in as well, um, and he was, uh, and the court found it to be a fair use. It was a transformative use of this material. And so uh, it wasn't an infringement. And so the answer isn't always no. Sometimes the answer is yes, you have a right as, a, as an artist to make fair use of other people's material. And the best thing is, as of yesterday, it's completely resolved because Tafner Entertainment has whatever, there's, there's word of a settlement, but there will be no further claim against the show. But that playwright has been enjoined from having that show produced. It was originally done in July 2012, and he's been prevented from making 
any money or having any productions from the show since that one production at Rattlestick in, in uh, the summer of 2012. Now, as of yesterday, it is finally 100% clear. But the key word, and Ralph used it, is transformative. Parody is one thing. There's also, as you may have read recently, um, there, the, the estate of uh, Abbott and Costello has sued about the use of the Who's On First routine in Hand to God. And the other day, I was reading, because it had not been published, I was reading again, Jesse Eisenberg's play, The Revisionist, and I get to this point and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> he used Who's On First. Now, apparently, who's on first is in the public domain, and I, from what I understand, but it's still an open question. But my point is, the material, if it's if as in a part of, uh, in 3C, that's a parody. Parody is something that the courts have agreed is is fair use. If you take a chunk of Long Day's Journey into Night and plunk it into the middle of your play, or, you know, or if you decide that you're going to put Mary Tyrone and James Tyrone in your play, which takes place in a suburb in, you know, Levittown, you're going to have issues with people. So it, it gets very... Well, yeah, there's an interesting sort of conversation there. So the dramatist play, as you probably know, anybody that's signed literary contracts to do work and whatnot, it's very, very clear. There, this isn't a dramatist contract. There may be no deletions, alterations, or changes of any kind made to the text. The title of the play may not be altered. So then it, it's very clear on that level. Um, at the same time, so you're suggesting that education and, and you, uh, you're suggesting, Cindy, you're suggesting education is uh, one key to try to, to grow the conversation, to let people uh, know that the playwrights work hard, Doug Wright says, and that they're rebuttal uh, to the, 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 the situation with your play that, uh, sure, you know, uh, when I work for film, I, I expect my work to be chopped up, hacked, the words to be changed, etc. but I get paid a small fortune in theater, I get paid nothing, so <laughs> I desperately at least want to make claim to my rights as, a, as an author, right? Well, there's something to that. Um, so this idea of, uh, of ownership and uh, being properly remunerated and all that, absolutely valid. Excuse me. This, this, this David Jemmy thing is very interesting because, yes, they, they ruled on the parody issue. They, they seem to use the word parody. They did use the word parody as a, as a validation for the claim. Uh, but at the same time, I find that word transformative very interesting, too. Isn't it an auteur director, really, author or not, trying to use material uh, in a transformative way to bring to light new issues or uh, uh, new ideas about the world around them. I'm not, you know, again, the legal, the legalities aside, because they're very clear. Well, they're not that clear. Uh, that's part of the problem. And so uh, language becomes very important. Transformative is a legal term. Besides being a word that has its own meaning, it has a legal definition and gavel at the end of a trial. You know, the point is to avoid a trial entirely. So transformative use is sort of a legal conclusion. Um, transformative with a small t, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, every, uh, every production is transformative of the script of that play. But, you know, that it's a, you're transforming something from a written work into a performed work. That translation is created by the director in, co in collaboration with everyone else on the production. But the, 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 that's not transformative with a capital T. I, I, I think, the, it, and it's not just limited to the theater. A few years back, and Ralph, you guys may know more about this than I, but there was a book called The Wind Ungone, which was it took Gone with the Wind and then it told it from, I believe, from the point of view of the enslaved people in the book. And I believe that the author won the case on that, but I still think that it's, as you say, it's, it's, a, it's something that is in terms of where we are on that issue in the theater and obviously in other uh, expressions of the written word. It's a, it's, it's a story that has not come to its conclusion yet in terms of what we know is true and what we know is not. Amanda, did you were going to say something? Yeah, that, that was just the, 
doing that. Yeah, I, I also think that sometimes, uh, like I, and I can only use my personal experience like with, with hands and a hard body, the director had such a different idea of what, well, first of all, he was mistakenly thinking like, I'm going to fix the show and I'm going to do, you know, which was no one asked him to. And um, he didn't. But um, also, if, if your interpretation is so at odds with the play, then don't do the play. You know what I mean? Like, if like this, sh this should be a play about blah blah blah. Well, then find a play about blah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if it's if it's uh, if it's so clashing with it. I mean, it, or, or else use the text without changing a word and make something, you know, totally new of it, which could be really exciting. You know. Um. I, 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 oh, yeah. Okay. What time? Do, wait, this is eleven fifteen, right? Yes. I'm really interested in a timeline for intervention. I'm really clear about what happens prior to opening or prior to rehearsal and after the show, but I'm wondering what other interventions happen and with the, all the financial you know, repercussions and if somebody would like to speak to that. Um, well, at least from, it happens at any point along the way. Sometimes we'll get a whistleblower, often a disgruntled actor. I, I don't say that with any judgment, but they'll, you know, contact us anonymously and say, so-and-so has made all these changes and you need to shut them down. So that can happen during rehearsal. It can happen once a review is seen. You know, now the internet used to use clipping services in the old days where you would have reviews from the papers all across the country sent to you so you could see what was happening with plays. Now we see them, you know, all practically in real time. When it happens, nine times out of ten, I will say that our buyer is mortified, horrified to find out that they have gotten themselves on the wrong side of the author, on the wrong side of Dramatis Play Service, and we will never do this again. Sometimes they, as in Amanda's case, they, they buck against it. In which case we have to say, you know what? We, you know, we, we can have the, the author, and sometimes we have to get into it, we can take legal steps to enjoin them from producing the play further if they refuse to stop. We can also say, we're not going to license to your company anymore because we can't trust that you are going to abide by the terms of the contract of which you are well aware. Um, it rarely gets to an extreme point. I, yeah, and I, I would like to just make very clear like the, the goal of, uh, as a writer and all of us is to have the plays done. I mean, exactly. nothing makes me happier. I've seen great productions, I've seen not so great productions, but I always am the fact that it's being done is wonderful. It would take, it takes a lot. You know, I've seen dopey changes and things, but they're like little, and I'm not gonna, sh I'm not gonna shut a production. You know, I mean, that's not my, I don't go to police a production. I go because it gives me extreme pleasure to see another production, you know, and someone else's interpretation. And I've seen people in, you know, a production in Dallas where I thought, my God, that guy's better than the guy I brought. You know, like, I never saw the song that way. And, you know, so that it, it, it seems like a punitive thing, but really that's the last measure. The last and, and, and we didn't, I, we, we, we even like, we weren't like, you're closed, you know, and thing, which it was the most extreme case I've certainly been involved with. They, they said, okay, 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 we'll put everything back. The director said, hey, we did it in one night. And he lied because they'd done it. Um, no, we didn't. No. We don't always have it. They, the author doesn't. Edward Albee does, but nobody but, does. But just to give another example, uh, prior to The Hands on a Hard Body, and another one that, that I'd looked into was uh, a production at the Oslo Theater in Florida of uh, Brian Friel's Philadelphia, Here I Come. And uh, the show was directed intriguingly by a director who is also a playwright, Frank Galati. Um, and he had eliminated several minor characters. He had interpolated musical interludes. And he had cut an intermission. Um, I became aware of it when there was a newspaper story in which the artistic director of the theater was defending um, that these changes had been made and decrying the fact that Mr. Friel did not come to see the production to see how well they worked. Um, Mr. Friel, of course, is 
relatively elderly and doesn't live in this country. Um, so what was interesting was in that case, and unfortunately uh, Bruce Lazarus uh, was not able to be with us today, um, Samuel French made very clear that the show needed to be fixed. And because Oslo is a repertory company, they were able to suspend performances of that show, add additional performances of other shows in rep at the time, and make the changes. And what I thought was the best reaction was the local critic who had initially given the show a very nice review. Um, and when I spoke with him and in looking into it, didn't seem to fully understand what the ramifications of this issue were. He did go back and review it um, after the, the play had been restored, and he literally wrote, it makes so much more sense. Yeah. Now. I, 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 interestingly, I was very surprised when I found out about this issue with uh, Brian Friel's play at the Oslo, because I, I represented Don DeLillo as a playwright. Uh, when I was an agent. And Don wrote a play um, called Valparaiso, which had its premiere at the American Repertory Theater in Boston. And Frank Galati wanted to direct it at Steppenwolf. And he asked for changes, which I always describe the, cha the kinds of changes which Frank wanted to make in this play as it was akin to if you did a production of Streetcar Named Desire and it started with Blanche being led off to the insane asylum. That's what Frank did with Valparaiso. He totally redid the structure of the play, but he asked permission to do it. And Don was like, okay, sure. You know, Don's a great guy. He was like, you could do it this one time. We'll see how it goes. And I will say, don't tell Don I said this, I thought it was much more entertaining in Chicago than I did in ART. But you know, here's the thing. It wasn't the play, but they asked. So I'm surprised Frank didn't just like go to Brian Friel and say, can we do this? Yeah, that's the thing. Asking is, because is, you never know what you're going to get. The Watermill Theater doing Sweeney Todd with all musicians playing this stuff. That was a huge hit. So you never know what's going to turn into something interesting, but everybody's open. Stephen Sondheim, it's very interesting. Stephen Sondheim is willing to permit reorchestrations of his work so long as the text is faithful, because certainly the Watermill and what John Doyle has done with several Sondheim shows, there was a uh, prog metal production of Sweeney Todd in Washington, D.C. last summer, which was sufficiently successful uh, and obviously met with, with Steve's approval that it is being done again this summer. There is an indie band called Devochka that's very popular in Denver, and they are doing, uh, they are behind uh, a reworking of the musical arrangements and orchestrations of Sweeney Todd. So long as the show is faithful, Steve seems to be willing to entertain different versions, and indeed there was a, a a production from the Chichester Festival that went to the West End in which uh, the show was visually reset from its original period into the mid-1930s. Thank you. I, so this, let's take some questions. I know there must be some. Um, I want to refer back to what Beth and Richard wrote in the description for this, um, this panel. Uh, where do we draw the line? And uh, this, for you, Ms. Green, and, and you guys, for anyone you represent, I'm just kind of curious. In your mind, although I know it's going to be case by case, is the line different for uh, people who want to shorten or change aesthetic in some way, which is, I think, the aesthetic issue is, to me, reprehensible, uh, versus the ones who want to be able to do it at that level by omitting, you know, fucks become facts or whatever, I don't know. Do you, do you make a distinction between those two? Totally, absolutely. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, it really, it really takes. I've never before thought I've been so, uh, you know, offended by a production because I've seen, as I said, I've seen all kinds. And yes, language changes. I may see it and even not agree with it, but I'm certainly not going to close your production. You know, I'll just be like, eh, didn't work for me. I, I, of course, we always like to be asked for us, and I'm and and are very amenable. Really, I mean, we've had, actually, for Hands on a Hard Body, the character of Norma is Hispanic, and someone said, we don't have a Hispanic woman who we feel is talented enough, we have a woman who's a thing, we're like, 
no, it was a different production. A different production. And we're like, great, okay, great. You know, I mean, so it's, it, it is a living, breathing thing. It's not, with us, it's not set in stone. It, ca it can't be set in stone. It can't be a line because every writer has their own line. Yeah. And every uh, situation is different. You may, there are things you may say no to a uh, regional theater or school doing that you may say yes to if it's a director you really want to do it, who's doing it in New York, which will add value to your work, and you're willing to have that version done on a higher level, or vice versa. You may not want it changed in New York, but are willing to let smaller productions do different things that are out of the sight of you know the general public. So there's no way to say you know what's below you know what's the line is. I will say that. There's, a, there's a, some controversy about what the text is. Um, as far as the guild is concerned, everything the writer puts on the page is the text, and that includes the stuff in parentheses. Uh, a lot of directors think, well, we'll scratch all that stuff out and start from scratch, as if that wasn't part of the play. When, when a parenthetical says, angrily, that's a stage direction. That's, that is about character, motivation. That is about character, intent. That is as important to that character as the line of dialogue they're saying. I, I, I need to interject here, and this specifically speaks to what I do, because I publish the acting editions of the play. Acting editions have now been published for, you know, many, many, many years. Part of the problem is that sometimes the text that you see in the acting edition from the older versions of the plays may not be what the author himself or herself actually wrote. It may actually more reflect the stage manager's version of the script, which has stage directions and even things. It, not always, and certainly not now, because now the author has primacy as, in terms of you know, looking at the text and making sure that what is published is what he or she wants to be published. And that is true, but it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, any changes to that script belong to the author. So even if the stage manager made a change, it's not for the license, so licensee to, to determine, well, this is a stage manager's direction so I can change it, and this is the author's so I can't. You have to assume it's all the authors, and you cannot change it. Uh, that being said, not all stage directions are created equally. Some are logistic. Some are about movement, or you know where the person is on the stage, where how things come in and out. Um, some are not integral to the character and the and the and the story. Some are what a stage manager or even an author visualized in their own head. So there, I think there's a lot more leeway in those kind of things, but again, not for the licensee to make those determinations on their own necessarily. They may, you may, if there's doubt, you may want to ask. I want, I want to give a quick example of, of a change that comes up a lot when you speak to what's actually the text. Um, I'll, I'll use the funny example first. Um, Given the recent trend towards more plays which are a single act, they may be a long single act, you will find at many regional theaters they want to insert intermissions because it cuts into um, concessions business. Um, a playwright has written a play with or without act breaks because they want a certain flow of action and the play can, can cease to make sense either by inserting a break because there's no, when you restart, you're not, you're, you're in the middle of a flow that was never meant to stop, or conversely, people who want to remove, reduce intermissions, three act plays that are now two, but were very clearly structured with the understanding that people were going to have gone away from it for a little bit, and suddenly, it becomes a different thing. So even something as simple as inserting an intermission or removing an intermission can make a big difference. I, I know uh, authors who've been furious about music, pre-curtain music or post-curtain music, because it affects the mood in the room in a way that they didn't intend. Um, so, you know, from our point of view, the, the moment 
you walk into the theater that the theater has opened and allowed an audience in, you are now, you know, seeing the play, whether the curtain is open or closed or whether actors are on stage or not at that moment. And there has to be some deference to the intent of the play. Uh, are there, uh, is there any other question? Uh, yes. Here comes the microphone. What a big room. Um, two, two questions. One that I didn't get to ask yesterday when the folks who were doing devised work um, came in to talk to us, which is a little bit about devising um, and the turn to devising and how that's changing the role of the writer and the role of citational practices um, versus, you know, sort of borrowing and plunking. I, I've known companies who kind of become devised companies um, because they, are frust they feel frustrated about getting to do things with plays. I, not the people who were here yesterday, but I'm just saying that as a strategy, so as a way to avoid having to struggle with playwrights and working on that. And the second question may be more important for what we're doing here. Have you experienced situations where dramaturgs can help stop this from happening and becoming problematic, right? So intervene with the director or negotiate between a director and a playwright so that a choice is made that is in respect of the text and is also forwarding what the production is trying to do or having that open conversation about it, because that seems sort of what our job is. With regard to devised texts, uh, the Guild has, has formed a committee to investigate the best way uh, to protect playwrights in those environments and to come up with criteria recommendations for our members when they, because right now it's sort of the wild west. It's all, every company is different in how they work and basically who owns and controls the text is who profits from it. And too often it's the production company, you know, the, the, the money that put it up the play becomes the owner of the play. And then you're entering the Hollywood model except without collective bargaining without health insurance, without all the other perks of being a, a screenwriter or a television writer. So we're very concerned, but we also acknowledge this is a growing field that more and more writers, our members want to be involved in this environment. So we're not looking to, you know, uh, stop it or inhibit it in any way. We're just trying to figure out how it's working and what ways would work best for writers in those environments. With regards to uh, the roles of Dramaturgs, um, I think the less I say on that, the better, probably. I'm not the <laughs> right person. Um, I, I, you know, once a devised, talking about devised text, once a devised text gets to my desk, by that point, usually, uh, it has, hopefully, it has been decided by the company who's going to take the credit and who's going to hold the copyright. And sometimes it's one person and sometimes it's more than one person and all of that has been worked out. I think with respect to dramaturgs and how they can effectively advocate to have the, the playwright's work uh, respected uh, and uh, avoid the problems that we've been talking about here, I don't think, I, I, I think that we shouldn't limit it to the playwright. I think what we talked about earlier is the most important thing. Everybody who's involved in the theater, everybody who works on the production, from the assistant stage manager to the actors, I mean, we all know actors can be very focused on one thing, you know, themselves. And they need to open up their minds as well, the designers, to be aware that when something goes off the tracks, somebody needs to put their hand up and not send an anonymous letter to me saying, so-and-so is doing this. It's just to say, wait a minute. Here's what the appropriate thing to do is, and we need to talk about how to make this work so that everybody's happy. The theater is a collaborative art. It should not come down to one person having to make that decision. I, I agree. I just want to say quickly too that it is it's very hard though because I know like even in the hands on heart body everybody everybody saw what was going on, everybody. And and they thought it was weird and they felt uncomfortable with the actors like this is the professional act
company. This is the only place they can get paid. They don't want the director was the artistic director. I mean, it's very hard sometimes to come forward. So I'm kind of an advocate of, of the anonymous phone call to the Dramatist Guild. Because yeah, I, I want mean, them too. No, you know what I mean? Oh, yes. I, you know, anywhere. But because I, I know how, it's such a small world. And you, if you're the whistleblower, you then, you know, you're, you know, so people are worried about that. So any, anyway, you can do it. It's, but I do agree. It's everybody's responsibility. I think we're running out of time, uh, but uh, uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, being here and uh, offering your great depth of knowledge and insight on the issue. Um, as a, as a takeaway, uh, I think they've all agreed from the author to the, uh, the agents and the agencies and uh, <laughs> the thinking against censorship is if you have an idea, talk about it, don't keep it to yourself, don't try to sneak it under the table, but don't let it lie fallow because it could actually be a great idea. So keep the conversation open and honest and come forward with, with all those great ideas that are going to make the next great thing happen. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. You have 15 minutes. Do what you want to do and then come on back for the inclusion and diversity conversation. <laughs>